Welcome to Seidel Overtones, I'm P.T. Gazelle. My guest this evening has a career that spans over 50 years. Just a few of the highlights include being inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame in 2010, Best Instrumentalist Award in 2014 and 15 for the Blues Music Awards, uh, a Grammy in 2014 for his collaborative work with Ben Harper on the uh, project Get Up, uh, over 20 individual solo CDs, and he's toured and recorded with some of the biggest names in the industry, including Cyndi Lauper, Bonnie Raitt, and Tom Waits, just to name a few. I'm extremely happy he's here to spend a little time with me this afternoon. Help me welcome the one and only Charlie Musselwhite. Hey, Charlie, how are you? How y'all doing? Good to see you. Well, it's great to see you, man. Thanks for taking time to do this. I really appreciate it. I do, too. So I was looking at your, you know, going back, I was, I was kind of trying to get a, a, a little bit of a flavor for, for the, 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 the breadth of your career. And um, I know that, you know, you mentioned a few names about people that, you know, you, you kind of idolized and, and, and hung around with in Chicago in, in the 60s. I guess what I'm interested in, though, is going back even a little bit further than that, what kind of music or who, what kind of stuff were you influenced by early on, even younger than, than the Chicago days? Well, when I was a teenager growing up in Memphis, I, would, I got into looking for blues records, 78s, and uh, I, I found a jukebox distributor that had tens of thousands of 45s, and I'd go all around Memphis. I'd go to used furniture stores and any kind of junk stores looking for anything that said blues on it. i just buy it. So I had stacks of all these 78s. That's where I discovered a lot of great harmonica. I, I found a 78 of that Palmer Maccabee, Lost Boy Blues, and Maccabee's Railroad Piece. That was just, it still is a killer tune when you listen wow. to it. And lots of uh, John Lee, Sonny Boy, the first Sonny Boy, and the second Sonny Boy. I didn't know that there was two Sonny Boys. I could not make sense out of I had these 78s, had the same name, and they both sang and they both played harmonica. They didn't sound like the same person, though. It couldn't possibly be two different people. This doesn't make sense. Later on, of course, I found out there were two Sonny Boys that played harmonica and sang. The harmonica really stood out to me. I loved all the guitar players too, but harmonica was special because it just, it was voice-like and uh, <clears throat> I had some harmonicas laying around that my dad had given me. And when I was about 13, I decided that uh, it felt so good to hear those harmonica players. It must feel even better to play your own blues. And that's when I, when I was about 13, I decided to just teach myself how to play. I'd go out in the woods and just make up stuff. How old were you, Charlie, when you made the decision to, to move to Chicago? I was 18. 18. And uh, I had been, well, <laughs> I had a little sideline of uh, delivering uh, moonshine in this old 1950 Lincoln that I had that I believe it had belonged to Ted Weems, another big band guy. Wow. And I brought it, bought it from his brother for ninety-nine dollars. It had a huge trunk, and I could get lots of five-gallon cans of moonshine in that trunk, and I could deliver them around different places. But anyhow, one day uh, the police were following me. I know they were following me, and I, that was my—I thought that was an omen. You know, it's time to get out of here. <laughs> so that's when I went to Chicago. Now, I didn't know anything about a blues scene in Chicago. I didn't have a clue. Uh, I had been told that anybody that was in the entertainment business either lived in New York City or Hollywood. So I thought guys like Buddy Waters, you know, were, would be in Hollywood or something. I didn't know. <laughs> uh, 
at first I, I wasn't going around telling anybody that I played. I wasn't asking to sit in. I was perfectly happy just hanging out, like say uh, a place like Pepper's Lounge on 43rd Street. It was open to four in the morning. Well, Saturday night they were open to five in the morning. And uh, I already knew how to drink coming from Memphis, <laughs> so I could hang out with the best of them. And uh, all those guys then, at that point, just thought I was a fan because I would re request tunes, you know. And uh, a guy like Buddy would say, well, how do you know that tune, boy? <laughs> well, I got the record. <laughs> and uh, so I had all the old records and, uh, and knew all the tunes. And uh, they just thought I was a a fan hanging out. Oh, only thing that was different was this was strictly adults. There was no 18 year olds my age, black or white, hanging out in these clubs. Right. So I really stood out. Yeah. But uh, I, you know, it wasn't until this waitress one night, well, I, <laughs> I'd gotten to know her pretty good. <laughs> she told Muddy, you ought to hear Charlie play harmonica. And it's like, what? The next thing I know, Buddy's calling me up to sit in, and that right. changed everything. Yeah. She, her telling Buddy I played, I turned a corner right there. Yeah. Well, that's cool, but you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, you, you've been in the right place at the right time, but you also got to be ready when, you, when you're in the right place at the right time, too, so. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that there was a chance for a, this young white kid to be in this business. I, it just never occurred to me it was something I could do. Uh, later on, of course, I met Bloomfield and Butterfield. These were guys my age, and they were, you know, like Paul was playing for sorority parties around the University of Chicago. And that was interesting. And wow, it, these guys are actually playing this music that I love, and they're getting paid for it. I, yeah. I, hell, I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you move to the to the West Coast, Charlie? Was it late '60s or early '70s? It was 1967 in uh, August or September. It was in the fall. I remember. Uh, I didn't really have any desire to go touring. I hadn't even thought about it. But that first album came out, and all of a sudden, I'm getting phone calls from all around the country. Come here, come here, play at our place over, and. I just kept putting it off till finally somebody offered me a whole month of work in California for really good money. And I thought, well, I'll just go out there and do those, those gigs and come on back to Chicago. But I got out to California and man, I don't think 10 minutes went by and I knew I wasn't going back to Chicago. <laughs> the sun was shining, the girls were beautiful and, uh, and they kind of looked at blues players like you're something exotic. I mean, they didn't know about blues. I've seen some old posters, you know, bill posters. Um, were you you were on the same bill, you know, with groups like Jefferson Airplane and Quicksilver Messenger Service? I mean, how cool was that? I mean, what was that like? Well, it was really interesting that uh, a guy like Bill Graham would book these shows and it'd be like, I don't know if this actually happened, but. It might be like Robbie Shankar and Albert King and Count Basie or something. <laughs> uh, and the, everybody just trusted the taste of uh, the booker, uh, you know, Graham. And plus they were listening to the underground radio, the hippie radio stations. They, were, they weren't playing me in Chicago, but they were playing me in San Francisco. And that was really what brought me out to San Francisco, the underground radio. In fact, that brought a lot of people out to California. You, your sound has pretty much remained constant from what I hear, and I think it's really cool. It's just, it's just so, it, it's just, it seems like there's always been that consistency. It's the, it's the Charlie Musselwhite sound over the years. Well, I always, from the very beginning, I don't know where I got that idea, but I had the idea that you would play your own blues. If you wanted to play blues, you, you, you made up your own blues. I mean, it's great to learn from other people, but ultimately you want to play your own expression. What's your like amp and, and microphone uh, preference these days? Well, here's my microphone. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's a oh, yeah. great and blows me away uh, with a, I think it's a sure 
bullet element in there. Greg can tell you about it more about it than I can. Yeah. And I have a Sonny Junior. I have a Sonny four different Sonny Junior amps. I got the Crusher and the, uh, I mean the Cruncher and the Super Sonny and uh, two more. <laughs> and do they do they all do they all sl have just a slightly different feel to them sonically? Yeah, each one is has a its own little different character, but they're all great. I can't part with any of them. When you when you first started playing Seidel products, were they already making them with the stainless steel reeds, or were they were they brass? Uh, the, the first ones I played didn't have stainless steel. I, I don't think they were making them yet. Okay. I might be wrong about that. Okay. But uh, the one I prefer is the. 1847 with the wood comb. The classic. St stainless steel reeds, yeah. 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 That's yeah. to me that's just a perfect diatonic harmonica, right out of the box. I don't do nothing to them. Wow. Yeah. You know, I've played like special uh homemade high end kind of harmonicas that but you know, right out of the box, nothing beats this. This is as good as a custom made in my way of thinking. This doesn't get any better. Yeah, well, it, it you know, they, they really shine in the studio, too, as far as I'm concerned. They really translate oh, yeah. well. So. Yeah, they hold up. They, they'll take a beating and keep on playing. And uh, yeah. I really, truly love them. <laughs> so what um, what's what's coming up for you in 2017? Is there any, any big projects coming up that uh, you want to talk about? Well, I just finished a couple of movies. Oh. But I get to play a little bit in. Uh, one of them is called Rebel on the Highway. It's a, a biker movie. And I play uh, Gabriel, except I don't play a trumpet. I play a harmonica. <laughs> and uh, it's about a race with the devil and all this stuff. And then there's another one called uh, Don't Shoot, I'm the Guitar Man. And it's about a friend of mine who used to teach guitar in San Quentin. And he wrote a book about it. And so they're made a, making a movie about it. And uh, I play a convict named Graves. And I play a little harmonica and, uh, and guitar, too, in that movie. And uh, recording-wise, uh, uh, going back in the studio with, with Ben Harper in January. Maybe we'll get another Grammy. I hope uh, so, man. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, after 11 nominations, it was I was happy with the nominations. That was good enough for me. But taking one home, well, now I'm hooked on that. I got to have another one. <laughs> well, we were all, we were all, believe me, the harmonica community was thrilled that you got it, man. Trust me. Well, thank you. Yeah. You know, win or lose, it's just great to be in the game. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. You know, and that's, and that's, we're going to, we're going to, uh, I just want to, and that was one of the things I wanted to tell you. It seemed, I mean, and I've been, I've been kind of like listening, knowing we were going to do this interview, and I've kind of been sampling like from stand back all the way up through, you know, I ain't lying. And it seems like you have not in, lost one bit of your enthusiasm for playing the harmonica, and I, I just think it's great, man. Well, it's endlessly interesting, and I'm still interested in what I can do with it, and exploring with it and having fun with it. A lot, you know, if you're having fun, you're learning. So don't let it ever turn into a chore. Always let it be fun. That, that's great advice. So the last thing I want to ask you, and I got to ask you this because if anybody has it, you would know. What do you, in your opinion, what's the roughest joint you ever played, Charlie? <laughs> well, there's uh, several that kind of I'm not sure which one was, was the roughest, but one, the first one was, was the Starlight Lounge in uh, Lepanto, Arkansas. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people say that was the roughest club in the South. And uh, there was a, what I remember was in the, on the back wall, there were two doors. And over each door, one said ladies and one said men. And either door you go out, you're just outside. <laughs> <laughs> just went out into the bushes. There was, there was no bathroom. There was no running water in this place. Maybe behind the bar, but uh, that was strictly a rough, rough, rough place. Uh, I mean, those old hillbilly bars were way rougher, in, in my opinion, than uh, the blues clubs. Uh, 
in the blues clubs, they were plenty rough, but it seemed like if you got in a problem, it was actually about something. Uh -huh. In these redneck hillbilly bars, it didn't have to be about anything. <laughs> there were guys in there just wanted to fight. Yeah. It didn't, might not ever seen you before, don't like the way you walk or the way you look or something. They want to mess your face up. Oh, man. I used to have problems in Chicago, and I would eventually came up with the idea of just carrying a hammer in my hand. If you're walking down the street with a hammer in your hand, <laughs> people get out of your way, and they don't <laughs> want nothing to do with you. Yeah. And you're not breaking the law, you just got a hammer in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Charlie, it's been great talking with you, man. Thanks so much for taking the time, and, and uh, I hope you have a, a great uh, holiday season and great best of luck to you in 2017. Keep doing what you're doing, man. Well, I don't know nothing else to do, and I hope you have a great year, and everybody tunes in to this. Hope they are having a great year, and hope I see all y'all down the line. Thanks, Charlie. See you. Thank you, man. Take it easy. <laughs>